Hey, what's up, guys? Chad Hermanson here with Mental Edge Training Coach. Today, I'm excited to bring on Josh Booty. Josh is a 1994 USA Today everything. <laughs> Josh is one of the few athletes that has played in the major leagues, and he's also played in the NFL, right? Deion Sanders, Brian Jordan, Bo Jackson kind of athlete we're talking about here. Josh is from Shreveport, Louisiana. I got to know Josh a little bit as we represented or were represented by the same agent, Jeff Morat. And so we kind of had that common thing going on there and being shortstops, you know, coming out of the draft. But Josh was an All-American as a shortstop and an All-American as a quarterback. So we're going to go through and I'm going to have him share really his story about how that all came about, uh, what it was like to be in that situation in, in both sports. Uh, he eventually went on to make it to the major leagues. And then after about five, four or five years, he decided that he had enough and he wanted to get back and go play college football with his brother at LSU, uh, where he got to play for coach Nick Saban at LSU and eventually had a little bit of NFL time with a couple of different teams and is also involved now in a pretty cool app that we're going to talk about. Uh, that's going to be toward the very end of the show here today. So enjoy this conversation with Josh Booty. And as always, if you are looking for personal coaching for yourself, for your athlete, looking for life coaching, go to chadhermansoncoaching.com, fill out that application, and I will personally contact you. I will text you to set up a call uh, where we can talk about your athlete and see how we can possibly help him or her. So enjoy this conversation with Josh Booty. All right, Josh Booty, what's going on, man? How are you? Man, I'm doing wonderful. I, when when you called and said you wanted to do a podcast, I'm like, I'm all in, brother. I love it. I, I know it's been a long time since we've got to, to hang out and those baseball days that were awesome, but I appreciate you having me on. This will be a lot of fun. Yeah, man, absolutely. It's We, we first met, I... I remember vividly. So Josh is a in school year wise, you're 94 grad. I was a 95 and just getting into the, I guess, paying attention mode of like, who are the best players in the country? We didn't have social media back then. No, no. And I just like, so my dad got us that baseball America subscription. And, and I was constantly like, who's the best who's doing these things. And your name was constantly coming up. And I'm like, this is the guy right here down in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, right? So yeah. I'm really curious about um, your whole high school experience. So, so to kind of start the show here, Josh has been, he played in the NFL and in the major leagues. So we're talking about a serious athlete here that has, has gone through some stuff in regards to just a lot of experience. So take us back to those high school days where you became like the top shortstop in the country. Yeah, my, my dad uh, was um, was a coach, um, was a football guy. My dad played college football. So I grew up, you know, with him loving football probably a lot more than baseball. But there was nothing like Little League baseball growing up. All my buddies were playing. Um, you know, if you grow up in the South, uh, wherever you're at, it's like there's a college team that, uh, you know, the SEC is so big. And I was always watching LSU football or LSU baseball or Mississippi State football or baseball. And my dad had gone to Mississippi State, but he's a Louisiana kid. He came when I was seven. We moved back to Louisiana. So all my friends are just big time. You know, their families, everybody's LSU fans. There's no other school in the state of Louisiana that LSU competes with inside the state. So I was always a, a guy that wanted to, uh, you know, go to LSU and, and, and play both. Uh, by the time I was probably 14 or 15, I started as a freshman. I got lucky. It was a new school, and I got started shortstop as a freshman and uh, really was thinking, I'm going to play baseball. I'm gonna, this is really what I want to do with my life. It was my favorite sport uh, just because I had so much fun, you know, in the summer playing ball and little league and all that, that it was what I wanted to do. And then uh, when my dad started the high school football program at Evangel Christian with another man, um, uh, a guy named Denny Duran, a famous uh, player, the quarterback at Tech, which is, you wouldn't mean anything on a national level, but Louisiana Tech won a couple of division 
uh, one double A national championships. And he became the head coach and him and my dad were really, really close. And they said, well, if you come out and play football, we'll go shotgun spread. Uh, nowadays, everybody's running the spread back in the 89, 90. No one was running. it. Everybody was just handing the ball off at the high school level. And we're really, Shreveport's really close to Texas border, like okay. two or three miles from the Texas border. And all those big East Texas schools were monster football programs. And they're, you know, it's Marshall, Longview, Lufkin, Tyler, uh, Dallas, Carter, all those schools back in the day. But everybody ran the rock, you know, and everybody was, everybody thought they wanted to, you know, have, uh, you know, guys like Earl Campbell or Ricky Williams, <laughs> you know, those type of guys. And, yeah. and so we're like, we'll throw the football. So I ended up playing football in high school and, you know, being the quarterback as a freshman. So I started shortstop and quarterback as a freshman. So I got all this experience when I was like 15, 16 years old, yeah. uh, you know, in both sports and um, playing all the schools, you know, in the area and, and all that. And then, I guess it was just, you know, there's nothing else to do growing up there. It's not like being in Southern California where I'm actually today where, you know, you got surfing, you got, you know, a million different things, the beach, you got parties, you got all this stuff going on. Like all we had was, was ball. And uh, I actually played point guard too and started as a, as a freshman and and on the basketball team. And it was a small, small school, but I played all three, you know, and it was like, you couldn't get get tennis in there too. Like what's, yeah, (laughs) I I should have played golf because I I wish my golf game was a little better now, but anyways, that, so that's kind of how I grew up. We didn't have anything else but ball. Uh, It was a Christian school. My dad was a coach and, and they, they let me throw the football and I got all these, you know, attempts, uh, you know, at bats uh, in baseball. And it was, it was a lot of fun. And by the time I was a junior or senior, um, I had had a lot of experience. I was 6'3", 210, um, you know, could really throw the football a long way, uh, could hit for power. Yeah. And uh, I think the measurables were, you know, he can throw 95 from the mound. He can, you know, throw the football 65, 70 yards. He, you know, he can hit it 500 feet, you know, back in the day, we didn't have social media, which we mentioned, but we had USA Today. We had Baseball America. I compared myself, or I was always watching the guys ahead of me, Derek Jeter and A-Rod, yeah. Yeah. and got a chance to play with A-Rod uh, the summer before my senior year on the USA team. And there was two or three of us that made the team as juniors. Me and Canerco started on the USA national team, and we traveled around, and A-Rod was the shortstop. I had to move over to third. This guy was the first pick in the draft. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, there were some guys that were at third base trying to go out for this position. And uh, I, the first day of the USA team, I don't want to be long-winded, but I, I ran out to short and I'm with A-Rod taking grounders. I'm like, this guy, everybody's here to see him. Ain't nobody here to see me. I'm a football <laughs> player, you know, slash baseball player. So I'm like, I go over to third. Well, it's Troy Gloss and Scott Rowland. It didn't get any easier. Oh, and, uh, the so biggest I'm, monsters out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, dude. I mean, the Canerco's at first. I mean, we got to, we got to, we got to swap, that's right? Sick. Yeah. And I go, and I ended up winning the third base battle and starting for the USA team and batting fourth and A Rod batted third. And, and so that was probably some of the stuff that you remember being a year behind me looking at Baseball America, seeing who's the next prospects for next year, because I was always comparing myself and that's all we had. So, I think, you know, there was no high school showcases like there are now. Perfect game. There, you know, all the stuff that, that you know about now. Um, so that that's really I played well in that. I played I really had an unbelievable junior and senior football. And then everybody came knocking in terms of, you know, all the big schools. I took my visits. But that that's that's kind of a high school uh, career and a little bit of a nutshell. We broke a lot of records because I uh, in football, I broke the national high school passing record yeah. for all time high school quarterbacks. And I think that's what really put me on the map in terms of being the top, top guy in football. And then in baseball, the USA stuff, playing yeah. a year early on that USA national team, that put me up there in baseball America ranking. So that's how it all kind of went down. So I, I, I got to I gotta go back to this team. So yeah, Corner, Connecticut at first. <laughs> You and A Rod go out to shortstop, and you got Gloss and Roland at third. So who's at second? Um, I'm trying to think who played second. One you, of those a guys. Guy, 
have to there, slide over to second. Yeah, there was a guy, Kelly Dransfeld, who went to Michigan. Yeah, great. Kelly player. was a shortstop too, and he went over to second base, and he was actually he might have been the best, the best just hitter on the team. To be honest with you, Conarco could just flat out hit. He had a sweet swing. A Rod was just faster than lightning. And I was just trying to out athlete the baseball. And <laughs> Dransfeld was a real player. You know, I mean, he was yeah. just a good, he was just like a, I don't know, a, a Kevin Elster type of guy. Like he just, mm-hmm. he knew how to play the game. He was a baseball player. He played a lot and, and ended up going to Michigan. So he was the other guy in that infield. Um, that was going out for the USA team. It was a uh, it was a uh, uh, Olympic festival deal. Yeah, so we were that was all a big going deal back then. Yeah. yeah, it was back then. Now yeah. I don't even know if they have it. <laughs> I'm, yeah, not I'm not sure. I mean, just USA teams, right? Yeah. So so someone had to go to the outfield or the bench. Like, like <laughs> I'm curious. Like, who's the outfield in this team? We yeah. had uh, Chad Green. I don't know if you remember yeah. him. Kentucky. He was a uh, went to Kentucky. Yeah. Flat out flyer. He was our. He was our leadoff guy. And then I'm trying to think who was in the outfield in the corners. Um, golly, who was it? I don't even – I'd have to look back. But we – Danny Peoples went to Texas. He was on the team. He was a very, very, very good college player. We had – our our ace was a guy named uh, – oh, Eddie Furness was there. You remember Eddie Furness went to LSU, the lefty first baseman? Yeah, but Conurco beat him out. And Conerco, was he still catching too at that point? He, no, he played first in that for that deal. Forget okay. who our catcher was. Uh, oh, Mark Johnson from Warner Robins. Yeah. 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 Mark Johnson caught Conerco first, Dransfield, A Rod, me, Chad Green. And then I'm trying to think who the outfielders were uh, on that team. I'll, I'll think of it in a minute, but that's been. Yeah. Dude, that was 1993. <laughs> <laughs> so crazy. Yeah, I'm thinking like, I mean, those that don't know, like Scott Rowland and Troy Gloss, what they're both six five. Yeah. And just hit the ball it's just a mile. Crazy, they, you know, they weren't as big and thick as we saw them on TV, of course, in the majors. Um, they were they were uh you know uh, leaner. They were real lean, they were young, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, they did. I when I saw Scott Rowland play when I when I got to the big leagues and he was with the Phillies, I was like, "That is, this ain't the same dude, man." He he turned into a monster. He and doubled like, in size, right? Yeah, and he just <laughs> tough, tough. Yeah, he doubled in size and he was just tough. You know, he yeah. just looked like a, you know, he looked like a linebacker or something. So I mean, he he definitely grew a ton over those probably three or four years. Mm. Yeah, so th- so that leads you into going into your senior year where you're – I mean, so we, so you were in the same draft class as then A-Rod. Was he ni- – or 93? Was he 93? Uh, he was one year ahead of me, yeah. So he was 93. You're 94. Um, now scouts are coming to your games probably like crazy, right? So what was that like for you? Did you feel the pressure of what that was like? Um, yeah, but I, we had – you know, football was such a uh, – I guess uh, uh, media drip, much more media driven for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in my little town of Shreveport, Louisiana, you know, it was like it, it kind of got to where I was on. Not, I don't want to say folk hero, but it was like yeah. everybody was watching what I did on the football field because I'd signed to play football at LSU, and so that fall before my spring baseball. I was really used to getting a lot of, um, you know, attention or media attention in terms of, and now they do a lot, lot more in media than they did back then, but I got about as much as I possibly could have. I think, I mean, they were chronicling, you know, every game I had, you know, everybody was always at the games, every head coach, you know, Bill Walsh to Bill McCartney to, you know, uh, Paterno, like all those football guys. So when it came to baseball, like the scouts, those were awesome. And I knew they were there and I was super pumped about them being there. But when Bill Walsh shows up at your school, yeah. or Paterno, that's like yeah. a different deal. Right. So I think I was used to the, uh, a little bit of that, um, attention or people coming in my senior year of baseball, but man, was I excited because I really wanted to play baseball. And I knew that it, even if I didn't get drafted or something happened, or I didn't get the money that I wanted, that I was going to go to LSU and play because mm-hmm. I ended up signing to play both sports, but 
you know, I, I don't think it was – it wasn't very – it wasn't overwhelming in the spring because I think the football thing was so – big in the fall before that, that I, I kind of got used to it. And, and that was a blessing. I think that I was yeah. ready for it. I was ready for it a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the movie that pops into my mind, like you were literally like Johnny be good. That movie, <laughs> Anthony Michael Hall, right? Like all the, like the top quarterback, all these scouts are showing up. So that, and that's, that totally makes sense that you were prepared for that, you know, going into the spring and, no problem if 50 to 100 scouts show up and they're watching my every move right and want to see me do well and also what is it like when he does fail it probably wasn't very often your senior year i'm I'm assuming well you know high school baseball like you you probably hit 700 (laughs) i didn't hit 700 but i you know my dad being a coach being an athlete understanding enough to tell me or to to walk me through some of the stuff it was like he wanted to he wanted he always wanted me to show off not 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 show off but you know instead of don't don't worry about throwing it over the first baseman's head on a ground ball like you throw it through the first baseman I mean if you the hose right yeah you show the hose if you you know if you throw it over and make sure it goes through the fence like don't (laughs) you know what I'm saying that was just the old mentality right it's like I, I wasn't I don't know I just didn't hold anything back and mm-hmm. I think you know and I ran decent uh you know hit for power in, in high school big time and no one pitched to me because you know I think I only got 70 at bats my senior year and I don't know 14 homers no one pitched <laughs> to me you know and it's not I mean your your numbers were the same I mean it you know all of us that were at the top kind of had those numbers hit 500 you know whatever and I don't know I just I wanted to play great defense um, so that, you know, I could get drafted high. I yep. knew I could hit for power, a 6'3", 210. And we had a smaller ballpark. It was like 370 to center, mm-hmm. you know, so I could hit balls all over the field. And so I didn't try to pull off it much, you know. I would stay – I could hit the ball to right center, and you know, in high school leave the yard and, and just because I think my, my athletic ability. But – I think, uh, you know, it was just fun. It was, I, yeah. I was having fun. I was having the time of my life. I know I was going to go to LSU no matter what. If I can get drafted real high, then that's just, that's just icing yeah. on an unbelievable year. And we'd won the football state title. So everybody uh, kind of followed that. Uh, mm-hmm. it, was, it was a lot of fun, man. Yeah. So you, so you get your senior years winding down. You've probably <laughs> have had agents coming to your house like crazy. And then you end up signing with Jeff Morad who we, we share a common thread with the same agent. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what was the agent experience like for you? Senior was it senior year. You eventually signed with him or. Yeah, I did. Or, or the handshake, right. We just do handshake. Yeah, it was a handshake. <laughs> we couldn't do anything like that, but yeah, I, you know, I went over to Arlington. Morad had, had called and I'd met with a couple of guys. I think Casey close Boris, the top guys and the agent business had really just really gotten go- going at that point, you know, and, it's, it wasn't like today where there's just a million of them. There was three or four big time guys and Jeff was one and he represented Will Clark. And so I'm like, he was my favorite player um, in baseball. And I'd studied, you know, I mean, I'd watched every baseball game that Will Clark played in that I could. Um, him and Elway were my two favorite athletes and on mm-hmm. the football side, Elway baseball, Will, but he represented Will. We went over to the ballpark. We went out to eat afterwards at Papa Do's in Arlington, uh, the little Cajun restaurant. And he brought Will uh, with with him. And I was with Todd Walker, who was also the top collegiate hitter uh, that year. That's quite a dinner right there. Yeah. That's so I'm thing. sitting there with Todd and he was, <laughs> you know, he's uh, LSU famous, you know, uh, yeah. player of the year, college world series, the whole thing. And then, and, and my dad and and Todd's father Art and and Will and and Jeff and we had dinner and I'm like, you know you, you don't even have to talk Jeff just don't say nothing you know I'm you're good enough for Will you're good enough for me and yeah. he's like yeah this is great and it um, and we sat and talked and and got to know him a little bit um, and uh, just fell in love with him I'm like yeah. dude this is the guy he's a stud I know he's negotiated every type of deal. He's got Steinberg on the football side, which in case that ever happened with me on the football side, I could always just stay within their organization. And it was a fit. Um, I just, but it was, it was just over one dinner with Will Clark. I I didn't need to see any, you know, 
I didn't booklets or anything like that. I just yeah. marketing material. I'm like, man, I, I trust this. Let's go. Yeah. So you, you mentioned Lee Steinberg too. So that was kind of an interesting thing where like literally <laughs> just like a month ago, my family, we were watching Jerry Maguire. <laughs> so Lee yeah. Steinberg, Jeff Morad, they're literally in that movie, right. Of, of kind of showing what it's like to, to be an agent and kind of the yeah. fanfare comes with that. And they would throw this party, the Super Bowl party every year. Right. That, <laughs> I, mean, I think we met there one time too. And um, the best. Speaking of Jerry Maguire, I, that's when I was with Brack and my wife. We were we were still dating because we're just out of high school, and and uh, we're sitting by one of the tables. And I kind of turn and look over to Bracken, and 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 I kind of give her like these eyes, like like my eyes go real big, and she's like, "What?" I'm like, "It's Cuba Gooding Jr. right there, <laughs> right there." <laughs> and give her like, "It's Cuba," yeah. <laughs> and uh That's she's awesome. like what yeah it, it, it was pretty cool so like you know the first time i was 18 years old around movie stars right i'm like oh not oh. not my crowd whatsoever but it was <laughs> you know it was just kind of like this is pretty cool you know yeah Drew Bart, so walked them. by you know and all these <laughs> stars right yeah so yeah. so uh, so you pick jeff right after that you have the draft what was the draft like for you? Cause you're, you're the, like the top high school shortstop in the country. Um, so you're probably have an idea of like, well, I'm going in the first round somewhere. What do you remember about that? Um, yeah. Um, the Marlins, I think that, I think of the Brewers, I'm, I'm trying to think back. I, I knew the Mets were going to go Paul Wilson. They wanted the big right-hander. He was the first pick overall from Florida state. And then the rest was kind of up for grabs. The A's, had talked to me, the Brewers, the, uh, I forget who else was the Astros. I think those are the three teams before number five mm -hmm. and the Marlins had number five and the Rockies had seven because I had, I had talked to the Rockies about doing football at Colorado for the Buffaloes and then playing baseball. So I know they're at seven, but the A's drafted Ben Grieve, who was a high school outfielder, uh, Tom Grieve's son and Ben went second overall, but, but um, I thought I might could end up there, but but Jeff had told them that the, that I wanted to make uh, more money than anybody in signing bonus history in baseball signing bonus an amateur draft history mm -hmm. uh, from a signing bonus perspective because for me to leave LSU to leave the football to do all that that's kind of what we set as a parameter and my dad helped me set that with Jeff um, saying hey if he doesn't get this then he'll go to school. And the A's weren't going to pay that. The Brewers shocking. weren't going to pay that. Yeah, it's shocking. <laughs> and, and I knew that at the time. Yeah. And he's like, well, Hyzinga has the fifth pick, the new franchise. Mm -hmm. You can climb the ladder fast. They'll put you – They'll, you know, you'll have a big league call-ups and all this. And and so he, he kind of orchestrated it. And uh, it was interesting that exactly what he said happened. I fell to, fell to fifth. They ended up giving me – what I wanted and um, with some call-ups and, but I had to si sign a five-year no football clause, which was like yeah, that's the hardest thing yeah. I've had to do. <laughs> yeah. Five <laughs> years. Yeah. Five years, no football clause. And so I signed that deal and I remember going back to my room and I had tears, you know, almost because I'm like, you know what, as good as football has been, whatever, I'm, I'm not going to play it. I'm going to go do the baseball thing. That was the, the, they gave me the money that I asked for. I told them I would go if I did, and they did it. And I said, I'm going baseball. I'm going to go try baseball. And I didn't know if I'd ever play football again. I just knew that I was going to go for my dream of making it to the big leagues. And, and uh, just like I wanted to play football, I wanted to make it to the big leagues. I just didn't know. You know, I just really didn't know which one. I wish I could have done both, I, I, you know. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm just going to go back. I'm going to go play baseball. Let's do it. I've got a great contract here. Why? I can't pass it up. You know, so that was when I signed and, and went along my way and, um, you know, started my journey, man. And it was not easy. <laughs> and, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah, let's let's dive into that. So I'm going to I'm going to give him the number because that's it's been a long time ago, but you got one point six in the draft, which was a record. at I think that time for the um, I think a few years later, we started to have the get more. <laughs> well, yeah. And it was kind of the uh, what was the like J.D. Drew, Matt White, you Matt know, all these 10 million, like kind of the loopholes they found right. in the draft. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, but no, it was it was a big deal. A um, lot of money, uh, still a lot of money, of course, but in 94. Right. So that was pretty, pretty incredible. So now you start your minor league career as the, the first round pick. You're going to the Marlins. How did that process work for you? Yeah, I, um, you know, I, I love being in South Florida. Uh, spring training was Cocoa Beach, uh, Melbourne, uh, Space Coast Stadium. And I remember I was, you know, went straight to big league camp, all that kind of stuff. So that was, I signed really late. So yeah. I had a four, I had four days. I went to instructional ball. So I'm backing up. I went to instructional or I went to, uh, what do you call it? Not instructional ball, but, uh, uh, where the spring training site is for all like the short extended, season, short season, a ball. Yeah, it's like extended, yeah, short extended, season. extended spring, extended spring. So I'm there. I go four days there. Uh, and then they send me to Elmira, New York, and I play four games there. And then my season was over. So I went to the Penn League for four games. <laughs> and then um, the next year they wanted to start me in Kane County, which is the Midwest League. But I go to big league camp. So now I'm in big league camp, whatever, 19 years old. Awesome. You experience some of the same stuff. But it's like, you know, I'm 19 years old. I don't know. You know, I hadn't been in the big leagues, but I've been around guys that, you know, have now at this point because of Morad and, you know, the USA team and, and some of the guys that were training me. I mean, I'm now I'm kind of getting in this baseball world and and uh, meeting a lot of amazing people and and doing the big league camp and Terry Pendleton, guys like Terry Pendleton and Andre Dawson, these legendary guys that I had watched, you know, on WGN or TNT, oh, you know. Yeah. Braves right. and the Cubs were the only teams on TV. So those guys were legends, right? And then mm -hmm. now we're going to play against Maddox and Smoltz and I'm in the lineup or whatever. Or I'm watching them go in in the fifth inning. You know, like it just was surreal, right, as a 19-year-old. Like, man, and then, and then I'm, you know, and then they send me to A-ball, Kane County, and I get up to Chicago and it's 17 degrees and we're <laughs> playing games like in April. You know, I'm like, what in the hell, you know? What have I done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what have I done? A wood bat for the first time. And I think it was just like, whoa, that that first like three months probably of that, of of A ball, being away from home. My brother, you know, I have three brothers, but my brother was a really good wide receiver that ended up going to LSU and ended up playing with me when I went back. But mm -hmm. he was playing at my high school. My dad and I was coaching football. I mean, every you know, and then they were winning, they kept winning titles and all. So it was, I missed football a lot, but that first three or four months or that first year or whatever of a ball, man, I was not, I was just like my head. I don't know if I wasn't there. It was just tough. And I was young and I was missing home and I missed football a little bit and, uh, you know, all that stuff. But between the lines, I was trying to do some damage. And I'm like, man, I got to get to double A or triple A. And I think I was trying to do too much, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. And mm -hmm. I see a rod, you know, climbing the ladder fast and he had gotten a call up and I'm like, holy, you know, I'm like, you know, this is not easy. And anyway, so it was very difficult because I think I tried to do too much. It's like, you know, sometimes like you see quarterbacks like Brett Favre, you know, sometimes he tries to do too much. It's like, okay, let's back up and just hit the open guy boom, boom, mm -hmm. and get back on schedule. It's like, let's get a knock, you know, let's, I was trying to, if I didn't, if I was over two, with two strikeouts, boy, I was trying to hit a, you know, a grand slam with nobody. Well, I got to show this power, right? I got to show this power so they'll bring me up because I don't want I don't want to be an A ball. You know, I'm like, dude, it's a part of the process. You know, you need thousand at bats or more. And so I was just I just got frustrated because I wanted to be so good so fast and I never dealt with failure. And so you know, it's a failure sport. And I had one guy that I was really close to, and I still am. He's my best buddy, Kevin Millar, who, you know, Major League Baseball Network, Red Sox, the whole thing. Like he was in my, he was like, almost like a big brother slash coach to me. And we ended up being best buddies, but like, I didn't really have anybody that, that I gravitated to as much as I did him. And we played a ball double eight. We played together coming up in spring training. We were roommates and instructional league. We were roommates and, you know, all this stuff. So I really leaned a lot on, Hey, you know, how do I, how do I go about just backing it up and trying to get successful at the plate instead of trying to do way too much. Like, 
I didn't take, I didn't want to ever walk. I didn't want to, you know, I swung at bad pitches. I was a free swinger, you know, so I knew I was going to strike out some cause I'm a, you know, they moved me to third base. I was 240 then, you know, trying to hit bombs. And so it was just a lot of transition. You're young, you're on the road, you're missed home. You don't really have someone that you can trust, you know, other than, you know, the hitting coaches were okay. I had, had some guys that I really liked, uh, Jack Maloof was the roving hitting instructor we had. I really liked him. Uh, uh, Jeff Pentland was my short season A ball guy, but I didn't have him after that. And I really liked Pentland. Um, Tony Perez coached me a little bit uh, or a lot of bit, uh, but I didn't, I mean, I, I don't know. I just trying to find myself. And, and so Kevin helped me a lot and uh, tried to move the ladder, but I struck out a ton, had some numbers in terms of home runs and stuff. I think, uh, you know, I hit 20 home runs in a ball, 20 in double A, but he also struck out 175 to 195 times. That's a lot when you, when you got 500 at bats. I mean, it's like pains, painstakingly too much, you know? Right. So yeah. that, that I had to, I went through a lot brother and trying to figure out how I was going to manipulate all that and get, get, you know, to where I could hit in the big leagues. And, and all I did was try to play great defense because I knew that could keep me in the lineup too, you know, and, and at least they'd be talking good about me if I played defense well. Yeah, no, in fact, I, I didn't know this when I was looking up some stuff on you that you were the 1997 minor league defensive player of the year. So, you yeah, I, I remember how smooth you were at, at third base at this point now, uh, but you made it, you made it look easy and then rifle for an arm. And I'm like, man, so like in my brain is the younger guy watching, you know, cause we're, I'm kind of going through the same struggles, right. Just a year yeah. behind um, yeah. later on. But um, I was like, man, this is hard. Right. But struggling and having some success here and there. So mm -hmm. For me, I was kind of the opposite struggling in the infield, throwing the ball all over the place, but hitting some homers, striking <laughs> out a lot, still yeah. some bases here and there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of like the players I talk to now. It's like, man, like this is a whole different level, you know, yeah. and like, and you said something earlier, like I, I didn't quite know how to fail yet because you were, you've always been the man, yeah. right. It had so much oh. success. You were probably bigger, stronger than everybody growing up to. And um, so it's a huge adjustment. Um, did you ever ask for help in regards to, cause we've talked about players of our age and era, there were yep. no, besides the main guys um, in the mental game, there weren't really guys around like there are today in the game. Did you, like you, so you confided in Millar, you know, yeah. and did you ever go to Jeff Moore and say, hey, Jeff, I'm kind of struggling here. Like, can oh, you yeah. some help for me? Oh, yeah. I think, you know, I, I harbored a lot in because I wanted, I don't want to show any kind of outwardly frustration or lack of confidence. You know, it's like, you want to be, be the whole package. So, you know, it's like, and you've got a probably a big ego, you know I mean? We were, we were top ranked kids and you got an ego, right? It's like, I got this. I'm going to figure it out. I got this. And you have to be like that. Cause you can't go to the plate thinking I can, yeah, which is a good person. thing. Right. So, yeah. I, you know, it's almost like you have to have that. And so, but then, you know, you would fail a lot. I would fail a lot. And then I'd want to try to make up for it. And I think that was, yeah, I, I did. I mean, I talked to, I talked to guys within the organization a little bit. I mean, they took, you know, they took care of me a little bit in terms of, okay, let's think about how we get on track. Let's think about how we get you, um, you know, pay more patient or, you know, I just wasn't patient. You know, I, I think that's the main thing. If I went back now, my, my personality is different. Mm -hmm. And I think I'd be more of a pro. And I think even in, on the football side, I mean, I can tell you some stories when we talk about football, probably in a little bit, but like even Saban, he goes, let, listen, let the players make the plays, like get the ball to the right guy, get it on time, be accurate. You don't have to throw five touchdowns on the first drive. You know, you're trying to win a Heisman trophy in a one drive. Like, what are you doing? You know, I think that's the same thing that I developed over in, on the baseball side was 0 for 3, 3 Ks, 0 for 4, you know, 2 Ks and you know, two ground out and like trying to hit a home run my fifth at bat. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Just get a knock. If the ball leaves the yard, leaves the yard, the yard yeah. because I would obviously, you know, in, it would end up not being good, uh, you know, 95% of the time me trying to do something more than, than I should. And so, 
even on, even on football side. So I think if I had to go back now, I'd be a lot more patient. I think I would see, you know, I would, I would, I would, I wouldn't try to be, uh, you know, I wouldn't try to hit 60 home runs at the minors. Yeah. I think I would just try to, you know, just drive the ball up the middle or something like that. I mean, I just wasn't, I, I don't know. I wasn't patient and I, I was stubborn. Yeah. And I wish I, I wish I could do that over again a little bit. And I, I know a lot of players have things that they think about, like, man, if I'd have just done this or just did that, or, you know, there's plays in football where if I'd have just made that decision or that, or I would have been wise, you know, with the football and not careless, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that's part of sports though, right? And growing yeah. up and being 19 and having those opportunities. And I mean, yeah, I mean, your swing, I remember watching you hit and your swing was sound. Like I tried to out athlete the baseball and, and like, you know, and it just doesn't happen like that. You know, baseball doesn't happen like that. You, like, you know, like a muscle, like out muscle it a little bit. Like, yeah, I think just, just go just after really hard, trying to right? attack, attack and like, you know, just out athlete and trying yeah. to, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> I like sick. that out athlete. Yeah. Yeah, like out athlete the baseball. Like these guys aren't athletes. Like the pitcher's not an athlete, and he's getting me out, and it just drives me crazy. And you know what I'm saying? Little things like that mm. drove me nuts about baseball, but it taught me a lot about about life. That's for sure. And uh, man, did I have some fun as well. It's just there's you know dwelling on right now dwelling on the the tough parts of it or talking about the tough parts of it. It was not being patient and trying to do too much. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's it's really easy to look back to and like, God, I could have done this or I should have yeah. done this. The could have and should have, right? Yeah. So, and that just makes us more frustrated, right? <laughs> it does. I'm like, it's like, man, now I need to go take a walk or something. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you, know, you I, I'm you, very you, thankful for those. Uh, yeah. For, the, well, for all the stuff, but at the same time, yeah, there's a lot you could probably go back and go, man, if I'd have just done this or that, if, man, you never know what would have happened. Maybe I'd have hit 330, not hit any homers, or maybe I'd have hit 50 homers in, in 330. If I, those guys like Torrey Hunter, mm -hmm. you know, he hit 210, 220, 230. We were in the same, we, we, we were almost like the same type of player. And, you know, he figured it out. He, you know, he got to where he was patient. He was quick with his hands. He was short to the baseball and he started getting knocks. And then all of a sudden he's in the big leagues and he's an all-star, you know, it's like Tory was just hitting 210 and in, in double a, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it's, yeah. it's, you evolve as a person in every, in every type of business or, you know, you, you want to evolve. I went back to, I went back to football instead of evolve. And that's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> You well, yeah, so so we, let's get to that. So you do eventually get to the big leagues. Like you battle it out. You're grinding it in the minor leagues. It probably doing like great days and probably some really crappy days too, right? But you get to that the big league level. Um, what, what year was that? 98? 98, 98 I started opening day. 97 I got called up. 97. So you get your taste. What was that like for you? Oh, it was good. I mean, I was – it was just a breath of fresh air to be in the big leagues and ballparks, you know, fun, uh, travel, better travel, you know, guys, big leaguers around name, you know, household names, stuff like that. That's what I liked. And, and Hazinga was trying to win a world series. And then we did in 97 and I had, I had been on, I'd been called up because Benia got hurt mm -hmm. at the end of the year. And I got like, I don't know, five at bats or something. I don't even remember. I had looked back, but not much in September. I just was there uh, for, you know, for them to probably give me a little bit of a taste of the big leagues. But, but, um, and then 1998, um, uh, Hazinga got rid of a lot of the players and moved them on because he won the World Series. And, yeah, and that was a weird, weird, weird time. Win the World Series, time. let's just get rid of all these guys. We'll get rid of everybody. Sheffield was the only name that was still there mm -hmm. um, that was really a big part. Conan, too, uh, that was really a big part of the 97 team and and uh, that had been around for that month of September in the playoffs. And so 98 uh, started opening day. Jim, I won the job in camp. I hit like 330 or something in spring training. Leland goes, hey, you don't even have to worry about hitting. Just play defense. He goes, you're as good as Ken Caminiti today, you know, yeah. on the defensive side. But, 
you know, you'll learn, you'll learn the offense. Just don't put pressure on yourself. Don't try to do too much. You know, he's, he's walking me through this mm-hmm. and started me opening day. He goes, I don't care where, what you hit. He hit, you hit, you can go one for 20. I don't even care. You know, he goes, just play D and learn and learn how to be a big leaguer. And then you'll start to feel comfortable. Well, like three weeks in the season, I get hurt. Jeremy Burnett slides over my thumb at third base. We're playing yeah. the Brewers. There's a throw from Sheffield from right, and I try to tag him on a, like a bang bang play at third, and he slid over my thumb and messed my ligaments up in my thumb on my left hand. And so for like three months, I set out. They sent me to Triple A Charlotte at the end of the year to get at bats, and I hit like I was like 11 for 100 yeah. at, in September or in the last part, I guess August, the late, late summer in Charlotte and I was just like phased out of it a little bit to be honest with you and was bumming a little bit and I knew football was coming back around I'm not playing summer (laughs) September's coming right September's coming like man if I could just get back to football and uh and it was just driving me crazy and then they called me in the offseason he sells the team to, to John Henry who now owns the Red Sox Huizinga did yeah and and then the Marlins brass told me I was going to start in Charlotte in triple a in 90 and 99. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I called Morad. I'm like, Hey, I got one year left of that. No football clause. Cause I'd been four years. He goes, I'm on meet. We'll meet in the, the super bowl was in new Orleans, I think. And, mm-hmm. and so we were all down there uh, during the off season at the super bowl. And Dombrowski was the GM. Dave Dombrowski, who's been around forever and won championships, but uh, as a GM, famous GM. But um, uh, Morad talked Dombrowski and Henry into letting me out of my contract a year early. Mm-hmm. I had to pay back that $80,000 AAA salary or whatever I was going to make. Okay. And I could go to LSU. And so I'm like, I ain't going to AAA. I'm going back to LSU. My brother was a freshman all SEC, started X receiver at LSU at the time and uh, was really had a good freshman year. And I'm like, I'm going to go back and play with my brother and try to win the quarterback job. Mm. And maybe I come back to baseball. Y'all hold my rights. Maybe not. I don't know. I'm going to go back and play football. And they probably didn't want me to come back. I don't know if they did or not. I mean, they still have my rights, but, but um, you know, I went back with the, with the thinking was I'm going to go try to make it to the NFL and I'm going to go play for two years. I'm going to get football two years, SEC, and I'll yeah. see if I can make it to the NFL and, and and play with my brother in Tiger Stadium. And so that's exactly what I did. I called up Jerry DiNardo, the head coach at the time at LSU. My dad goes, don't go to LSU. They, they don't throw the ball. You yeah. need to go to Oklahoma, Florida State, Miami, go somewhere, BYU, go somewhere and throw the football because they're going to hand it off and you're going to be in a boring offense. You're not going to like it. You're a shotgun guy. I'm like, but I want to play with my brother. And uh, my dad like told your brother, me, man. Yeah, but I do. <laughs> I'm like, I want to play with my brother in Tiger Stadium. It's always yeah. what I wanted. So yeah. I went and did it. And uh, my dad was right. Uh, bad, bad coaching, bad team, run, running offense, no, no real – understanding of the past game the culture wasn't there in terms of a passing game culture I'm a throwing quarterback and uh, anyways first year was tough they fired the head coach Donardo because of that mm-hmm. really 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 bad staff uh, and then here comes Saban and Jimbo Fisher who's A&M's offensive uh, head coach was my offensive coordinator and they helped me turn it around a little bit because we started to play with balance. I started to understand how to watch film, you know, stuff like that. And it just was night, night and day. So we went from like four and seven to like nine and three. Um, anyways, and, and I had a chance to, uh, you know, I, I was, I got all sec quarterback, which was, was yeah. big because no one had gotten that uh, award in, at LSU in like, I don't know, it'd been 15 years or something. And, and so that was a big deal. And then, uh, and then I'm like, I'm going to the draft. I'm 25. You know, I'm older now. Mm-hmm. I said, I got to go to the draft and see if I can get drafted. So Time, time's clicking away here. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm getting old, man. I'm, yeah. Uh, now I'm getting old now, you know, two years, a lot, a lot of transpire. We, it was tough. Very, very tough. It was just, it was probably tougher than the minor leagues 99 at LSU. But when Saban came, 
we learned how to learn how to work hard, smart, better. You know, just, we just had a better organization and better offensive staff, defensive staff. LSU got better quick, and I, I got to take take part in a little bit of that. Yeah. So you so you get to. I mean, Nick Saban, right? We all know if you pay any attention to college football, who he is with Alabama now, and what was that like for you? Was was he at that intense level back then as well? Ooh, big time. I think he probably more um, chip on his shoulder. Had never won a national championship. Was a bad. Was a military guy. Um, you know, yeller, screamer, energy, energy. You know, was way through the roof, discipline, uh, hard ass. Mm. Called him Nick Dick. I mean, this guy's gnarly. <laughs> And, uh, you know, now he's a little bit, you know, he, you can still see he's, I mean, everybody knows he's a fiery, fiery, fiery dude. I mean, he wears his, his feelings on his sleeve. He dog cussed the coaches in front of us, us in front of the coaches. I mean, it was no one, no one was safe. No, and, uh, <laughs> no one was safe. You know what I'm saying? And so yeah. I got, I, you know, and I got yelled at a lot, but, so did Jimbo, who was a young offensive coordinator that yeah. was working with me, at, you know, on on the quarterback stuff, and 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 so we, I felt like we were kind of in the same boat. Me and Jimbo coming up at the same time, and Jimbo had a real he he's 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 got a potty mouth like Saban, and both of them would get on get on me, you know, and stuff. But it was good. I mean, I I like to get coached. I love their fire. I love their commitment to you know, every little thing being perfect. And I learned a lot, um, learned how to, like I said, watch film, compete uh, at, at a very, very high level in terms of, of uh, you know, but football is so different than baseball. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's an ultimate sport for, to me it is because there's, there's just bigger, faster, stronger. You know, I love that part about football. I love the, um the locker room and football it's just real it's real high strong compared mm -hmm. to, to baseball is relaxed you get to play again tomorrow we'll go get them boys yeah. tomorrow we Football's have 140 like, plus of these things right yeah it's like <laughs> i wish football might have i wish there would have been a little bit more like that but it was like it was it was high intensity um you know you just got so many great athletes that are trying to learn how to how to manage situations and and uh you know the weight room is such a big deal the the speed and strength conditioning is such a big deal Saban did all that he brought in a strength and conditioning coach it was unbelievable uh Tommy Moffat who retired last year and he's probably the most well-known college guy for a long time he was at Miami with the Canes with Ray Lewis and all those guys back in the day but anyways I it was just a different mentality it's like how how you know how how good a shape can we get into mm -hmm. how much can we retain in terms of you know of the plays and and you know and how much can you put into a week uh to get prepared for a game and then the sec you know you got all the pageantry and everything fun about that i love that um i like teeing it up once a week like that that was fun right. um i also like playing every day in baseball but but Saban got us, got me prepared for, you know, to at least make a run to get to the NFL. And, uh, you know, I felt like I didn't want to be in college any longer. I was a little older than everybody. And I'm like, I'm not going to go another year. I got to, I got to test test myself at the combine and do all that stuff. And, and, and went, went ahead and entered all that. Was your, uh, I would assume your nickname was like grandpa pops. Yeah. Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much, I, all the guys. I was the only one with 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 a little bit of money too, because I had some baseball money, right? Yeah. So they were all asking me. You know, they all wanted me to take them to dinner all the time. Or they, <laughs> I think I bought two or three scooters for guys. I mean, they would beg me until I just. I'm like, dude, y'all got to shut up. You here's, you know, here's two grand. Go get you a scooter. I kind of can't hear yourself. I can't hear you talk. Asking me for money every day. They're always booty, booty, booty. I'm, 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 you know, everybody's right. wanting, you know, there's a hundred guys in the locker room, you know. Right. Uh, Jim, I remember Jimbo, he had, you know, coaches weren't making what they do now either. I, mean, I think Jimbo was making, it was his first big contract as a coach and he was making 300 a year and he had just gotten that deal. And 
after practice, we'd go up and eat, uh, we'd go up and watch film. And then at the end of the film session or middle of the film session, you know, it'd be seven at night and we'd been, you know, school all day, we'd workouts, whatever. And then Jimbo would be like, Hey, y'all want some pizza or something? Oh, we'll get some pizza up here. And then we, we'd all be like, all the quarterbacks, say, yeah, let's get some pizza. He'd be mm-hmm. like, Booty, order the pizza. I'm like, me? He goes, right. well, you make more money than all of us. So you're ordering the pizza. I, and he'd say that like every day. <laughs> now he's making like 72 million you know 10 years yeah. 72 million dollar contract I'm like you order the pizza jimbo yeah. no uh yeah. anyways but just stuff like that we were just kids trying to figure it out and uh you know we had a hard-ass coach like saban at lsu who demanded you know a lot from us and that was the best thing that probably ever happened to me because i it, it it gave me discipline and I think the minor leagues, you kind of get away from being disciplined a little bit. And it got me into like a military discipline type of, of uh, situation. And I had to get my, I had to get my stuff together, you know, in yeah. terms of, okay, let's, let's, let's get a strict, strict diet. You know, I got down to 208, I think, or 206. Like mm. I was running, I, we were sprinting every, I mean, I remember baseball, if they made us run poles after, practice I, or game not practice but after game i'd be like dude no way are you serious you know, I, are you serious <laughs> i mean in bait in football man it'd be like we'd be running 40 40 yard dashes or 24 110 after practice and yeah. it just got to be a part of it you know and there was no complaining and i'm like i kind of wish i had that mentality and take it back to baseball now mm-hmm. <laughs> it yeah. was weird i just got all these emotions you know all the time about baseball and football Sure. No, I, I would imagine. And I, I, you're right. Like there was really no, like thinking of the minor leagues mainly, like, I mean, you, you have your routine, you're doing your stuff, but like, it's, there's nobody really on you for the most part, especially maybe a guys like us that were the higher picks, like, cause we were, I think we were determined to go get the work done, right. Yeah. To work stuff. And I, I personally had my stuff that I was like, dude, I, someone needs to help me throw the ball to first, you know? And <laughs> <laughs> like I'm so up in my head at 18, 19 years old. I'm like, I got to get out of here. Right. So get me in the outfield. Um, and I was just scared to death to share that with anybody. Right. Yeah. And just having the yips for the most part. That's the real, that's real stuff. That's like me hitting. I was like, I didn't want to, I didn't want to ever come across like I, I was needy or I couldn't figure it out because then you, then you're a mental midget or something. You know what I'm saying? Like you get labeled, no, no, no. right. Yeah. 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 It's like, okay, I'll figure this out. We, we got this. So, and then it would just, it just got, you know, it just, it's just tough. I mean, it's, there's not, you know, anything in life that's, 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 uh, that's worth getting is not easy. And we went through it. We went through it. And that, you know, I think even Jimbo, when I was at LSU and Fisher would always, you know, he goes, you know what, you come to practice every day, and don't have many days I go well that's because I think it's because of baseball like we had to play every day and at seven o'clock you better have your eye your head on straight you know what I'm saying and and you have to bring it every day and it's just something that just you just end up having to do because it's just over and over and over and over and you're in the field playing third base you got to be you got to be present you know Mm -hmm. and especially in the hot corner you know so I I think that's one of the things I was like man I will never have a real bad practice day um, because of baseball, you know, on the football side, because every day was so important, you know, and we had to tee it up every day in football. It's only once a week, you know? Yeah. Um, yep. And then the bullets are really flying and it's a whole diff- <laughs> different, it's a different thing, you know, yeah. it's a different well, thing. And you're playing like, what, what does LSU hold in that stadium? It is like a hundred, I don't know, 102. We're talking six figures of people, right? That yeah. is- probably that way every game and just a whole different level it's like yeah the vibe <laughs> yeah and i could see why yeah. that would be attractive to go to to do that and um so you have your your football career lsu you're there 99 2000 you're playing for saban now comes the nfl in the draft you said mentioned the combine so you've already been to the big leagues right now i'm, I'm have a potential to go to the nfl tell us about that process yeah, um, I entered the combine. Uh, Steinberg was representing me on the football side now. I kind of crossed over. Um, Morad was getting out of the business um, at that point. And, uh, you know, I got invited to go to the, the, the combine. And like I mentioned, I was all SEC uh, first team, which kind of gave me that 
you know, not everybody gets invited to combine, but it's like 300 and something players. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I was going to get that opportunity. Um, did that was pretty happy with everything except my 40 at the combine. Um, I ran like a four, eight flat, which is weird. I, and I run fat better than that. I, mm -hmm. It was just, I don't know. It was a bad day. I, I got a bad start. You only get to run it. I think I ran it twice. It was like four, eight, four, eight, three. I mean, it was just bad. And I'm, mm -hmm. so I was disappointed in that, but you know, I, and I knew I wasn't going to be a first round pick because I didn't really have, I didn't light it up in college and I was in Vic's draft, Vic and uh, mm. Drew Brees, and I knew they were going to be the first rounders. And I'm like, I'm probably going to be like in that middle somewhere. And I really thought I was going to get drafted in like the third round. And Jerry Jones had called me the night before the draft, and he said, I'm going to get you in the third round if you're there. And I'm like, perfect. It's close to home, whatever. Louisiana, <laughs> Dallas, whatever. And mm. so I really thought I was going to be, I was going to be drafted by Dallas in the third round. He goes, we're not going to take a quarterback for that. Well, second round, watch the second round. They draft your boy Quincy Carter, who I know too. He's a baseball guy. In the second round from Georgia, and we had played Georgia. You know, I'm like going, what? You know, I was I was first team all SEC, and they picked Quincy, and he's he's like me. We're both athletic guys, but yeah. he had run a four or five or something like that. You know, and I'm like, dang, dude, Quincy Carter. So I'm like, man, I don't know where I'm going now. Well. I didn't get chosen until the sixth round by uh, by Mike Holmgren in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And so that was probably the roughest part of football for me was that first year at LSU and then sitting there for that draft because I, I really thought I was going to be a third or fourth rounder. And Steinberg thought I was going to be a third. Everybody did. And, it, and I was just waiting until the sixth. And so it was tough. And, and then, um, you know, I go up to see I, – I, I end up signing with Seattle – going up there and I was with Hasselback and he was having a bad camp. He'd come from, this is all football stuff, but he was having a tough camp. He had come from green Bay he had backed up far home and got the job in Seattle brought, brought uh, Hasselback over. He, cause he, he knew the offense, the West coast offense. And then he didn't play very well in camp and home didn't think he could start. So Dilfer, Trent Dilfer had just won a super bowl with the Ravens and hadn't signed with anybody. So they bring Dilfer in uh, like two weeks before the season starts to start the first couple games. And then, so I was kind of the odd man out and they go, we're going to put you on practice squad. Well, if you go on practice squad, other teams can pick you up mm. for 24 hours. You can get uh, claimed off waivers. Um, if you're on practice squad and I had three teams claim me up and then it was like Jacksonville, Dallas, and Cleveland. Well, you got to go to the team with the worst record the year before. And it was the Browns. Wow. Wow. So now I'm in Cleveland yeah. the next day. And so the first, the first game of the season in Cleveland was against Seattle. And I just <laughs> left there like the day before. <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm on Cleveland's team. It's just sports, right? It's business, yeah. but now I'm on, I sat there for three years, backed up Tim Couch. He was the first pick in the draft. Never really got to play. Uh, everybody got fired. Uh, Butch Davis was the head coach there. I'll go quick through this. Everybody got fired. He got fired. We all got released. Two years later, I get signed by the Raiders and Lane Kiffin uh, in Oakland when Al Davis was still alive. And uh, I, w I got to go to camp with them. Same thing happened. Jamarcus, first pick, wasn't ready to play. Al Davis brought Dante Culpepper in. They, they released me. That was in 2007, so I never really played football after that. I never was on a team after 2007. Um, you know, so so Ray, that that camp with the Raiders was my last real go at the, at the, at football. I, I always thought I'd sign with somebody else. It never happened, and mm -hmm. I think it was because I was you know 29, 30. Uh, what was I? I mean, 32. I was 32. Okay. Yeah, uh, and it's like you know I haven't gotten any starts really and now there's 22 year old kids coming in they can pay half or a third of what I would have had to make uh based on just the minimums and you know the way that the salary cap works so sure. that, that's kind of how it how it ended uh on the football side was that that camp with the Raiders yeah so I that it just makes me think so I would have like the word frustration comes up for me like that feeling that emotion I, I would have to imagine you had a lot of that over the course uh, of years I did, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that I, I got to do both. And, you know, I, a lot of what I do now is, is 
it's kind of like predicated, not predicated, but like people know me as kind of like, I, I got a chance to do both. Right. And, and so a lot of opportunities have come from probably from that. And, uh, you know, people say drafted in two sport, you know, anytime I'm at a, in a golf tournament or yeah. whatever, you know, people talk about it, but it's, it's like, a big deal. Yeah. yeah it's, it's I mean, impressive. It is, it is, but it's like, you know, you wish, well, you know what, what it would have been like if I'm glad I got to do both. I, yeah. I did get to play in the SEC set the stuff that you hit on Saban, you know, uh, played in the NFL, whatever, played in baseball. <laughs> whatever. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's like, but I, I, well, I'm just saying it's it's cool, but it's like, you know what, you know, everybody wants to win a Super Bowl. Everybody right. wants to be Derek Jeter, right? And so it's like, it's tough because it, maybe if I'd have stuck with one or from the get go, one or the other, that probably would have happened. But yeah, I've got I've got a different story, you know, and. I've done a whole lot of other stuff. I just, that, that was kind of my sports story. I, I still feel like I could play, you know, two years ago, I went over to Europe team USA. I played quarterback for them in a exhibition game against the uh, NFL European all-star team. I mean, oh, nice. I, I, yeah. I still feel like I could play, you know, I was, I went, I, I won that knuckleball show and I went to spring. Yeah. Spring. So, let's, let's dive into that. Cause I, I, <laughs> I didn't know about that. So as I was looking some stuff up, MLB Network throws this this challenge, <laughs> if you will. Uh, they're trying to find the next great knuckleballer, right? So <laughs> yeah. tell us about that and what intrigued you about that. Um, well, the network called and they they wanted to do a reality show, kind of like the big break in golf, you know, where competition reality. And they go, we're going to do it on a knuckleball or knuckleball competition reality. I'm like, that sounds fun, you know, because it's just <laughs> kind of funny, right? Yeah. And and uh, Wakefield and Charlie Huff were knuckleballers that, that were involved in the show. And they were going to get Kevin Millar to host it. And that's my guy. So I'm like, of course I'll do the show. Let's go do it. And they, and they wanted to bring like five or six baseball guys, uh, football guys. They, they, they said the knuckleball is more of like an upright pitch. So it's weird. And you probably know it because, you, you know, so many we've shagged so many balls out. Wow. And field, you know, throw knuckleballs. Mess around with it messing around just big bat and practice type stuff you know we're just out there goofing off but uh the the it's almost like a quarterback you stand up right and the ball kind of gets ahead of your body like when you're pitching and you're really coming off the mound and you're forcing yourself with all that the g force to home plate like a real pitcher throwing 90 you know he's way out in front of it knuckleballers you kind of got to stay behind it so the 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 ball is I mean, you know what I'm saying? The hand, you're not you're not really leading with your chest with the ball back here. It's thrown almost like a, a quarterback would throw like a check down, yeah. you know. That's where football guys could be like, oh, I might be able to do this. Exactly. So they're like they that that's what that was the whole major league baseball network's thinking is we'll bring in some football guys and see if we can teach them how to throw because more of like short step. You know, you you've seen Wakefield throw a hundred times, a million times. Like it's a it's a real quick jab step, and then the mm. ball kind of gets in front of your body to control it. And so they thought it was going to be good for a quarterback. And we had the competition reality show, and guys like uh, Doug Flutie was on it. Uh, David Green went to Georgia. He was a lefty. We had a lefty knuckleballer in the show. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I, so we had a competition reality show, and I ended up winning winning the show and. And uh, Wakefield and, and Huff are like, man, you're, you throw this harder than uh, we did, you know, and you're not bad. Like, uh, right. yeah, the, the, you know, it's pretty funny. And um, and so they sent me they sent me to work with uh, how what's the knuckleballer that, that, that was in Arizona that was uh, I can't remember his name. Anyways, he worked with me for a little bit. I worked with several guys on the knuckleball. And then I went to camp with the Diamondbacks. The part of the the show was if you if you win the show, uh, and we feel like you can go, you know, we're going to send you to uh, spring training, and you're going to go pitch for the Diamondbacks. Well, I didn't know it was like big league camp and all that. So now, next thing you know, a month you're after the show, I'm in big league camp. <laughs> I'm back 15 years later. Yeah. Now I'm dressed in like, you know, number 69 and I'm throwing knuckleballs. I mean, it's the funniest <laughs> stuff you've ever seen. You're like, you can appreciate this because you've been there. Like, and all these guys, like, who the heck is this guy? You know, and they were the quarterback. Like, 
Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's like, what is this booty? guy? You know? I remember been, that name, Booty. Yeah, yeah, they're spending their whole life getting there, and then I'm just there throwing a knuckleball, and I just show up, you know. It was just like – it was funny. And I pitched against the Giants three times, an inning apiece, three outings, struck out five, bro, big uh. leaguers. Struck out five, and I'd mix in like a – I mix in like a 90 mile an hour fastball and it, it's, you know, they were like, toes. whoa, to keep on their toes. And, and I had, I had worked with some hitters too. Like I'd gone and worked with Sheffield. I'd gone and worked with Adam Dunn, Lance Bergman in Houston at Marucci USA baseball. I'd pitch to them and I said, listen, y'all tell me what you think, you know, and they would give me little pointers like let's throw this on this pitch, throw this. And then Wakefield, I'd talk to him every night, you know, it was weird, but I, but I, you know, I wasn't giving up home runs. I, I was walking. Now I walked like five and three innings, and I, I struck out five. Don't throwing it for strikes is the hardest part. And then yeah. if I'd get down two zero, you know, I'd throw knuckle knuckle two zero. I'd come back fastball ninety, and they and then hitters would be like, Whoa. and they there was no book out on me, you know, so sure. nothing. <laughs> so it was like that was kind of funny. I was blowing a ninety mile an hour bomb and. They're like, whoa, you know, and yeah. Chef feels like that's that 90 looks like 120 after you yeah, got that 60 mile fast. knuckleball. Mm -hmm. So it was fast. And and so, you know, Wake feels like you can pitch in the big leagues doing it. So they all they're all telling me this stuff and they're probably just talking shit. But <laughs> they're you know, telling me what I want to hear. They're probably laughing at me going, Yeah, oh, God, this guy yeah. Select. but I was trying I was trying to do it and um Anyways, the, they tried to send me to double A after spring training. I was there to the last two days and they're like Mobile, Alabama. I'm like, uh uh. <laughs> I said, I've done, I ain't going on no bus rides in double A. There ain't no yeah. way. And uh, if I knew there was a real, you know, I think into it or, you know, a, a way sure. for me to pitch maybe in the big league, I would have done it for a month or two and see what. But, I, I didn't think there was any future in Arizona because they're they're, they're dry air and the climate. There's no knuckleballers do really, there, yeah, yeah. Like Wakefield, he would have never made it there, and he everybody knows that. So, um, you know, I tried to Wakefield tried to get me signed by Boston, but they had another knuckleballer that's been there uh, the last five years, or I guess five years ago now. But he mm -hmm. was back back then, and uh, nothing ever really. They're going, we can't have two knuckleballers, you know, and then. The Marlins actually had my rights, so whoever signed me would have to, you know, purchase my rights for three thousand dollars or something, probably. But, awesome. but so that yeah. it was just a fun, it was a fun deal that ended up, you know, being more fun than anything. But it was, it was, uh, I'd never been so nervous in my life as throwing a knuckleball against big league hitters in a big oh, yeah. game because uh, it was like sixty-five mile an hour knuckleballs, and you're just hoping they don't crush it <laughs> or hit one back at you. Yeah. Yeah, dude, that's yeah. amazing. That's what a great experience, though. That's so cool. It was fun. So, so you, we'll kind of shift here to your, your playing career is over. Done the MLB, playing the NFL. Um, we're getting closer to fifty, right? <laughs> <laughs> Forty-eight, yeah, uh, 40, Saturday, right? So you got, but you got a lot of stuff going on now in your life. Uh, tell us about this Bula, one of your yeah. new businesses you got going on. Yeah, so me and my youngest brother, Jack, um, are developing the first ever true social uh, gambling app where you can challenge, dare, wager your friends uh, in a social environment um, for everyone to see uh, with a verdict. So I can bet you, you can't get the girl's number at the bar or a video game or high school football. It can be absolutely anything. It's blank canvas stuff. So think like TikTok, mm. creating videos with with venmo so with a banking functionality with wallet functionality so you can bet on anything anytime anywhere or challenge or dare your friends to anything anytime anywhere and you can do it for pride too it doesn't have to be money it's going to be tokens for 17 and under so i could say you know i could say uh chad i bet your son can't well, ain't going to hit 400 this year and you say i bet you he hits 400 i bet you 100 bucks you just put it on the app and then so it it uh, memorializes it. It locks it in where you cannot get out of the bed. Where there's mm. judge capabilities as well. So there's no there's no bookie involved. It's peer to peer transaction fee only. We think this thing 
can actually change the way a lot of people bet because, and they think peer to peer gambling is, is the future as well. The, yeah. the, you know, the plus plus one thirty five minus minus one sixty five. you, you live in Vegas, you understand it so well. I don't know but, anything about gambling and I made it a, a reason why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah, know. The you're, lingo you're, smart, you're smart, yeah. man. Um, I think that's, the, I think the way that people have gambled, uh, through, uh, you know, the sports books is a little bit outdated. Um, it's okay. like the taxi approach and we're the Uber. It's like, I would rather bet my buddy 20 bucks that LSU beats Alabama than I would, uh, you know, the computer. There's no fun in it. There's no yeah. fun. There's no bragging rights. There's no content. It's like bringing all that together. It's like jackass, dude, perfect, handicapping, sure. all rolled into one. It's like, I bet you can't make a half court basketball shot for 10 Dude. and yeah. then you film it and you show it and everybody sees it and it's fun and people can piggyback bets or challenges or dares or wagers so we think it's got uh you know it's a global play for us i mean we're really wanting to create like a like a tiktok type of uh scenario um so a guy, some- so so on that just real quick the video so someone say you and i made a bet or something you you film it it's is it usually it doesn't have to be filmed but it can be to make it fun well, it's all video based, so you'd have to film okay. portions of it for sure. So, okay. like you lock in the bet, and and you 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 have to write it in, and it's not it won't. You know, we've streamlined it to where it's like it'll take you ten or fifteen seconds. Like if you're on hole number one, this is uh, the the whole gist of it was you better be able to make a bet really fast mm-hmm. on the golf course or you know in the middle of something so that you can streamline this app streamlines the bet okay. and. Okay. That was the whole thing. So, like, you, you can do it pretty fast. You agree to the terms. You send out the bula. He, well, they have to agree to the terms. You send out the bula. So you just add a few little things into the into the screen, and then uh, they accept it, and then you're on your way. So, but then it's all video based. So if you like if you said, okay, we're betting twenty dollars a hole in golf. I mean, I might video you on hole number one hitting it, your drive and or hitting it into the woods or yeah. or putting missing a putt on on number nine you know or something like that it's yeah. just content it's content based um okay. you know you'd video the score of your madden game or a touchdown that you made on madden if you're playing video games for money it's just a way for people to have have fun create content with there being something on the line yeah that's awesome and what is bula like i've never heard that bula before. Yeah, Bula means wishing you luck or life. It's Fijian. It's an island term. So we've just we're using like a little island uh, tiki character uh, yeah. to try to gamify it a little bit. So yeah. you'll see the little tiki guy, uh, the Bula character. Um, Jack, do you have the Bula? Let me see your hat real quick. Uh, my brother's sitting right here. He just walked in. Uh, I'll show it to you. So this is the. Can you see that? The Bula oh, there we character? go. Yeah. He's 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 a little gamey. Can you see that? I don't know if it, and then Bula. Well, there yeah. you go. Yep. So um yeah, it's just a way for people to have fun and, and put a little put their money or their uh put their money where their mouth is. <laughs> I just I just thinking about you and your brothers, you're like just talking crap probably all the time. You're like, Dude, exactly we, we how this, is that how it came about, basically? That's exactly how it came about. Well, my brother he bet one of our buddies in Atlanta uh, and won in a golf match. And we're having a few beers in the, in the clubhouse afterwards at golf club of Georgia. And my buddy, he's an older gentleman, super wealthy. He goes a thousand dollars a hole tomorrow, a thousand dollars a hole. And Jack's like, you're going to get beat bad if you do that or whatever. They're talking trash. And, uh, and so he goes seven thirty tea time in the morning. So we get up at six o'clock, drive to the golf course. They're going to play for a thousand dollars hole. When we get there, he goes, dude, I'm too hung over. We're going to play for 10. We're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We woke up, came all the way out here just for a thousand dollars hole. Like we're playing this. He goes, no, I'm too hung over. I ain't doing that. <laughs> and, and we're like, see, if you'd have had that memorialized and locked in it, that's exactly what this app does. When you accept it, it takes the money and puts it in escrow to where it locks it in. So you okay. can't get out of a bet. So like if, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, oh I, I lost 40. I had, I don't have my wallet or I don't have, you know, I don't have no cash. I'll Venmo you and then you never see them again. Sure. That's how we, we ended up thinking about memorializing it. And then we go, we should put it in a social environment for everybody to see. Because if me and you are golfing 
or maybe me and you were going on a golf trip with some buddies and we hit some buddies that didn't go, they could actually make bets from their office going, I bet you won't shoot 80 today for a hundred. And I bet you Chad beats Josh by five strokes, you know, right, I mean, right. there's just, you can do so much on it that you can create bets and piggyback bets and there's going to be partial betting too. So, so yeah. celebrities will be able to come on and like Dave Portnoy, the barstool guy, he's, he bets, you know, sometimes 10,000 bucks on games. Well, now he, fans could take part in the bet. So I could I could throw out, okay, I got LSU minus three against Ole Miss. Who wants some up to 10,000 bucks or 1,000 bucks? And people could go, well, I'll take 100 of it. I'll take 100. I'll take 100. So it's just ways – it's that's just peer-to-peer, peer-to-peer yeah. peer stuff. Yeah, that's that, – that'll be fun. Yeah, that'll make yeah. it make It, it good. should be fun. <laughs> yeah. That, that's what we're trying to do, make it fun. That's awesome. Well, that's good, man. So you get you got some business going. I, I see on social media all the time. It seems like you're always in a new spot. Um, it sounds like you have a lot of football. You know, you're still involved heavily in that. Yeah. Um, so just as far as kind of wrapping this up, as far as a takeaway goes, you know, like a lot of my programs about talking and working with young athletes, you know, and even parents, like through the process of being a parent, right? So. Yeah. What what would you say to a say a high school athlete in regards to working on their mental game? Like what what should they do? Maybe some thoughts there. Yeah, I think you know kids are growing up different these days because we again we did mention the social media. There's a lot out there for them to see. I think you know there is we didn't we didn't have the tools that they have now, and you know, but there's a lot more thrown at them uh for the most part but we had a lot thrown on us being at the top of the the food chain i guess in high school uh sports but for the most part most kids they're trying to just figure it out right figure themselves out figure out you know a lot of these kids do work real hard a lot of these kids and their parents they you know kids are playing 80 games in the summer sometimes and travel teams and and they spend a lot of money and they're, you know, it's just, it's, it's big time stuff. There's, there's a lot going on. I just, for kids, it's like to keep it fun. Like if I'm a scout and I'm watching you and I know you've done some of that stuff too, in the agent business, it's like, it's like, I want to see someone that's having fun, uh, that's running around, making everybody a little bit better. Um, and you know, so that's attractive to me on on the on the sports side. I want to see I want to see someone having a lot of fun, enjoying what they're doing, uh, you know, getting their teammates fired up, getting them engaged. Uh, you know, that's that's in every sport, uh, being a leader. Um, but but like handling stuff. Like I've got twin boys, and one of them's really good. They play football and baseball. One of them's really good in football. One of them's really good in baseball. And they both love both the sports, but it's hard. It's hard for them to understand, you know, I guess they, they want, they want to, you know, they want Saban to come and offer them tomorrow and not everybody gets that opportunity. And it doesn't matter how you get there. You know, it's just that it's not really how you start. It's how you finish. And, you know, we were high picks, but like Kevin Millar, who we mentioned, he was a undrafted free agent and now is really the, the voice of baseball on major league baseball network and won a world series with the red Sox, And, you know, it didn't really, doesn't really matter how you get there. You just got to find a way and keep grinding and you got to work your tail off because there's a lot of people doing a lot uh, to get, to try to get there. And I think it's super specialized now. Um, I don't think I could do what I did back then. Now I think I'd have to choose one. It's just sure. super tough. I mean, so I, I don't know. I just, it's a broad question, but I think there's, I think you've got to give yourself, you know, my, my, my nephew, he's at Oklahoma. He's a red shirt. So he'll be a red shirt sophomore in the fall. He's a quarterback for the Sooners. Okay. He did. He went to Allen high school. He was a third team, all state Texas, uh, Texas six, a no, no, no big scholarship offers, no LSU, no, no Texas A&M, no Texas, no Oklahoma, no not TCU, none of that. Mm-hmm. He goes, I'm going to go to junior college for a year and I'm going to make myself better. I'm going to get, I'm going to throw four or 500 balls playing a bunch of football games. And I bet I get an opportunity. 
Mm. What did he do? He went to Tyler Junior College. They went to the Junior College National Championship or semifinal, sorry. And then Oklahoma calls and says, we want you. And um, and it's a different route. Like I went yeah. straight to the Marlins, you know, big league camp. You were drafted early. Some kids go straight to, you know, Arch Manning goes straight to Texas. He's the guy. But there's other routes, you know, and Millar's route, General Booty, my nephew's route. I mean, I think these kids need to understand there's a lot of different ways to get there. Aaron Rodgers just signed the largest deal ever before Lamar Jackson did two days ago, whatever. And and uh, and he went to junior college, you know, for a year and didn't have any scholarship offers. So, I mean, I think these kids are real hard on themselves when they don't need to be. Everybody's got a different career path. You know, we talked about Scott Rowland growing up in three years and was a monster in the big leagues when he wasn't as big a monster as maybe uh, we were in high school. You know, and so I think it's just uh, everybody, everybody's a little different. And if, you're, if you if you want it bad enough, you're going to find a way and just keep grinding. And that's what I tell my kids. Hey, you might not be a first rounder. You might not be a 10th round. You might not even get drafted, but how bad do you want it? Because you're going to you're gonna have to want it bad when you're going through those minor leagues or you're in junior college or you're getting hit in the mouth on Saturdays in the SEC because ain't nothing come easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, man. That's yeah. awesome. Well, that's great, man. I mean, and kudos to you for just how you went about your approach and and – it's nice to talk to a guy like you knowing how hard it actually is, right? And, yeah. and the, the actual grind it is. And from a hitting and made and baseball perspective, how hard it is to hit at su such a high level. I, I've certainly grown to have more of an appreciation for these guys that are in the big leagues. <clears throat> and they just every year, they just hit, hit, hit. And it, it's <laughs> fascinating. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, they're that good. It's so, unbelievable. I think the golf is the same way, not yeah. to cut you off, but it's like these yeah. guys, they're at the top of their game. It's just the mental approach, the physical, you know, the gift that you got to be gifted to a certain extent, but those guys grind, man. I mean, they grind and hit a lot of balls and, and it's, you know, in baseball, it's T work, soft toss, thinking, thinking the right things, mental dealing with failure. There's just so many things to it. You know, football, it's, you know, being fearless, handling situations, the pressure, you know, getting it to the right guy, being smart, being patient. There's just a million things to sports, and that's what makes it so amazing, you know, and you went through it and made it to the big league. It's the same thing. It's like these kids need to understand it doesn't come easy, man. It is a, it is tough as nails. Mm -hmm. And when you get there, that's why everybody glorifies you because you've done gone through a lot to get there, you know, and you, you sacrifice a lot, and you're mentally tough at that point, you know, and – and uh, there's a reason that you're in the big league. It's, these kids just need to, to get mentally tough if they really want to get there because it's a grind. Yeah, love it, man. Well, Josh, best of luck to you, man, and this this bullet Thanks. and this app. I think it's going to be really <laughs> cool And once that kind of gets fired up. But I love watching your stuff on social media. Nothing but the best to you, to your boys, right? In their, Thank in you, their, their high school careers. Hopefully we see them in college and, and, and maybe in the, awesome. in the road. So best of luck to you, and thanks for coming on. Man, thanks for having me. It was a real pleasure. Great catching up with you. You're awesome, brother. Thanks, man. Thanks, thanks guys. We'll see you in the next show.